Hello, my name is David Hicks. Thank you for tuning in to the I'm Excited podcast. By the way, my dogs are in the room, so if at any point you see uh, a dog, it, it is mine, and uh, my apologies for that. I'm not going to kick them out at this point. But yes, thank you for tuning in to the I'm Excited podcast. I am very excited to be going through this subject. It is a tough one, and I'm hoping it is helpful. We've been talking about love and suffering. Along those lines, I just I feel called to keep you up to date. I've been talking about Jackson Igo, a teenager who uh, has been in the hospital now for 150 days, either today or it'll be 150 tomorrow, and just suffering a lot. So if you pray for Jackson Igo, his mother Elizabeth, whose own mom has been in the hospital recently, Josh Igo, and their daughter. Morgan, Jackson's sister, Morgan. It would be greatly appreciated. So, having said that, you may wonder, you know, why this? Why is Jackson, or why is why am I, or why is this person I love having to suffer? Or you know, right now, Russia has invaded Ukraine, and so you may be thinking, why does God allow countries to go to war and and things like that? And so. Today, what I wanted to start doing was talk about various sources of suffering. Where does suffering come from? Where, what, and why? So, the hope here is not to provide you an immediate pain reliever, but to provide you some things that might help you process hardship, difficulties that you or someone you love may be going through. So if we stop and think about it, there's suffering that is directly tied to sin. Suffering that is directly tied to things that that humans do wrong. We disobey God and it brings suffering. There's other suffering that is not related to sin. And if you're watching the video, you may be surprised that there's a whole lot more bullet points, I guess you might say, under suffering not related to sin than there is suffering that is related to sin. But we'll get to those next week. For now, I just want to concentrate on suffering that is directly related to human disobedience. So when we think about that, one thing that's easy to see is sometimes my own sin, our sin, can bring us suffering. It can bring natural consequences, or it can bring supernatural consequences. Now, what do I mean by that? So, an example of someone sinning and it bringing suffering into their own life are the thieves that were crucified with Jesus. In Luke chapter 23, we're reading about the death of Jesus. And he's not alone. Two others are being crucified with him. Now, in other accounts of the story, they're referred to as thieves. Here in this translation, they're just called simply criminals. I'll probably refer to them as thieves since we know that's what they did wrong. But we read this, Luke chapter 23, verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Behold the love of Jesus. He is pleading for mercy on the people who are putting him to death. That is loving your enemies. That is loving those who don't love you. That is the kind of love to which God and Jesus call us an extraordinary love that goes beyond just loving people that love us and are nice to us. This goes far beyond that in that he's pleading for mercy for his murderers. So they're up there on the cross and and people are coming by and they're making fun of Jesus and saying, if you're a king of the Jews, save yourself. And then we get to verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Christ means he was supposed to be the one chosen by God to save the Israelites, to save the Jews. He says, aren't you the Christ? 
Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. <laughs> I think you probably saw Daisy. But anyway, it's a beautiful story. Because one, in, in this sense, if one thief is, is, for whatever reason, is starting in on Jesus, trying to make fun of him, like others were, but this one, the, but the other stands up for Jesus. He's the only one since the time that Jesus was arrested till his death here that we see boldly standing up for Jesus. And he's a criminal. But he acknowledges we're getting what our deeds deserve. He acknowledged we are getting the consequences of our actions. Our sin brought this upon ourselves. And he accepted that. But he pointed to Jesus and said, this man has done nothing wrong. And when he asked to be remembered, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. That, by the way, is hope to hold on to. Whatever's going on in your life, if you hold on to your faith in God, hold on to your faith in Jesus. When this life is over, a paradise awaits. A paradise awaits. So, sometimes we do wrong, and, it, and just very naturally, it brings disaster into our own life. But sometimes, it's the, the consequences, are, as I said, are supernatural, meaning God is bringing a punishment a consequence, something into our life because of the sin that we committed. One example that starts that stands out is the sad story of King David, King David, said David, <laughs> David and Bathsheba. King David was at, in Jerusalem, the capital of of, the, of Israel. He was on the palace roof walking about. His army was out fighting the Ammonites long way away. So he's wandering about and be, lo and behold on the roof of a house nearby was a beautiful woman bathing. Bathsheba, ironically enough, was her name. She was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah was one of Jesus, um, one of Jesus, one of David's faithful soldiers out in this war that was going on, out fighting. So David calls Bathsheba over and they end up sleeping together and she gets pregnant. When David finds out she's pregnant, he calls for Uriah to come home from the battle and acts as if he cares about what's going on. You know, hey, how's the war going? Uriah gives them a new report. They have a feast together. And then Uriah does something unusual. He just slept there at the palace, I think at the palace gate. When David realized that Uriah hadn't got, gone home, he asked him, uh, why don't you go home? Well, Uriah was a man of principle. He said, how can I go home and sleep with my wife, which David wanted him to do, so he'd think the baby was his, how can I go home and sleep with my wife when my fellow soldiers are out there fighting? I can't do that. So David said, stay here one more night, and then I'll, I'll send you back out. So that night, David holds another feast, and he gets Uriah drunk. I mean, as, as drunk as he possibly can. And yet Uriah, Uriah, even in his drunken state, refused to go home. So David, in, in desperation to save himself embarrassment, writes a letter, seals it, says, hey, Uriah, please give this to the commander. What Uriah didn't know was that it was his own death sentence. 
Uriah takes it to the commander. The commander reads it, and it says to put Uriah at the front of, of the hottest battle and then withdraw from him so that he can be struck down and die. Now, this is a command from the king, so the commander doesn't know really what's going on or why King David would say that, so he obeys. He puts Uriah in the front lines, and he ends up getting shot by arrows and dies. And then Bathsheba, after a time of mourning for her husband, David takes her, and she becomes his wife. But what David did was not pleasing to the Lord. So God sends... uh, after the baby is born, God sends the prophet Nathan to David to confront him on his sin, on what he had done wrong. It's a, I can't, for the sake of time, I can't read everything that Nathan said to David. Basically, he just tells him a story that suckers David into being getting real upset over the evil, uh, the villain of the story. And then Nathan says, you're the villain. To paraphrase. And then David realizes, yeah, I messed up in a major way. Nathan talks about many consequences that were going to come to David and his family because of what he had done. And then we get to this in verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. But because by doing this, you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt. And in other translations, you've given uh, cause to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The son born to you will die. And that is what happened. The child born to David and Bathsheba, that child ended up dying. Now later they would have another child, Solomon, and he would become the next king of Israel. But that child did indeed die. That's a supernatural consequence. It's not normally the child wouldn't have gotten sick, but in this case it did because it was from God as a consequence of David's great evil. So that's those are examples of how we can sin and it brings suffering into our own lives. Now, a second thing that can happen is someone else's sin can bring suffering into my life. And it may it can be sin directly against me, my, my family, my loved ones that affects me directly, or it can be someone else messed up. It wasn't aimed at me in any shape, form, or fashion, but it still makes my life more difficult. So let's look at the first example where someone else's sin brings me suffering and it's it's directly against me. In this case, we're going to talk about the sin of the Egyptians against the Israelites. This is Exodus chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. There, to, to give you the backstory, there was a man in the Old Testament, very faithful to God, named Abram. Later, God changed his name to Abraham. He had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. God also called Jacob Israel. And so his descendants were known as the Israelites. They were also known as Hebrews. They were also known later, much later, as the Jews. All right, Exodus 1, chapter 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who entered Egypt with Jacob, each with his family. Now, there was a famine in the land. And so Jacob and all his family moved to Egypt because there was grain there. The reason there was grain there was because Jacob's son Joseph had been sold by his brothers who were jealous of him as to be a slave in Egypt. And through a series of of God's providential guidance, Joseph becomes second in command of all of Egypt and ends up saving Egypt from this famine. And so now he wants his family to come join him in Egypt. So here are the sons of Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous so that the land was filled with them. Then a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. 
Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Python and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So that the, so the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. Now, then there's a story about how the king orders the Hebrew midwives to kill the baby boys. They refuse to do it. They deceived Pharaoh and, and how they ended up getting out of that command. Uh, in fact, God rewards the midwives with their own families because they refused to follow Pharaoh's order. And then we read this at the end of the chapter, verse 22. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every boy that is born, you must throw into the river, but let every girl live. So here we see much hardship brought into the lives of the Israelites, the Hebrews, from the Egyptians. Slavery extreme, difficult, bitter, hard work, and even the killing of their own sons. So obviously then, that's going to bring a lot of pain and a lot of heartache into their lives. But what about the indirect kind of thing, where someone else's sin, it wasn't pointed, the gun wasn't pointed at me, my loved ones, but it hurt us nonetheless. Well, I think of Adam and Eve as prime examples of this. Adam and Eve were the first man and woman. And when they, God gave them a garden in which to live, the Garden of Eden, it, in that garden there were two special trees, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the one with the forbidden fruit. You've probably heard of that at least. And so God had, you know, God had made Adam and Eve to, to be as innocent as, you know, a four-year-old child, three-year-old child. And yet they were old enough to be in a, in a marital relationship. And God had warned them, don't eat from the tree with the forbidden fruit, the, the tree with the, of knowledge of good and evil. What God knew it would do, and he didn't tell them this as far as I know, it's not written for us if he ever said anything to this effect, is that by eating that tree, it would rob them of their innocence. And then they would be, become prone to doing evil. They'd become vulnerable to temptation and prone to doing evil. So, over the course of time, Adam and Eve disobey. They eat the fruit that God told them not to eat. And so, as a con here's part of the consequences that God gave to Adam and Eve for their disobedience. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 to the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. That's one of the major consequences. Childbirth was never supposed to be as painful as it is. However painful that might be, I have no clue. Uh, Carol Burnett, I think it was, uh, described childbirth as uh, taking your bottom lip and, and pulling it over your head. So that, that might give you a good idea that <laughs> that's painful. So that was because of Eve's sin. Adam's sin was even worse, the consequence. He, God said, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. Then he goes on to describe how hard it's going to be just to get crops to grow that he's going to need to eat to survive. And then he says, until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, from for dust you are, and to dust you will return. God made man from the dust of the ground. And God said, you're going to return to dust. That's what happened to that's what happens to our bodies when we die, of course. They deteriorate, they become dust. And so that was a consequence of Adam's sin. Now, yes, that means that if Adam hadn't sinned, death would not exist. And I'm not going to get into that right now. I don't have time. But yes, it was a consequence. Mortality, okay, is a consequence of Adam's sin. 
So neither Adam and Eve were trying to sit, you know, had their arrows aimed at us. They were not trying to sin against us. But what they did brought consequences into our lives. Now, if you compare the two, we can accept the fact that if we mess up and it, it, it brings us hardship, we can deal with that. In fact, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 37 through 39 says this. I need to <laughs> stop taking my glasses on and off. Who can speak and have it happen if the Lord has not decreed it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Why should any living man complain when punished for his sins? Now, we'll, we should probably focus on that part about, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Probably need to focus on that in the next podcast. But the verse I really wanted you to see for now is, why should any living man complain when punished for his sins? So we can accept that, hey, I did wrong and I brought tragedy into my own life. It's my fault. The one that's hard to accept for, for very obvious reasons is, is someone else messing up and it making my life difficult, it making my life hard. And, and sometimes those difficulties are, are minor, but sometimes they're major. Maybe I or, or my child was sexually abused by another family member. Or someone I know was raped, or someone I know was murdered, or, or I'm in jail, maybe for decades because someone lied and they think I'm guilty, or they didn't care enough to seek true justice, so they just, hey, here's someone we can blame. So those are just a few examples of how someone else's sin can can bring wreak havoc in my life or the life of somebody I love. That is not easy to deal with. Not at all. And if God is love and if God is all powerful, why is he allowing this? Yes, he said he's taking it away, but why is he allowing it now? Why now? Well, Jesus addressed this in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 24. It says this, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. In other translations, uh, tares, T-A-R-E-S. Uh, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Now the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. So later they come to him and say, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. In verse 37, it says, Jesus answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. Now that's a term that Jesus often used to refer to himself. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. 
All right, so what do we see? Jesus sowed good seed. Jesus worked to bring about sons of the kingdom, sons of God, daughters of God, those who would do what was right, those to put their faith in the Lord. The enemy, the devil, Satan, had other plans. And ultimately, the source of evil, you can point to him and thank him for it. And so now we have this situation where we have wheat growing beside the weeds. The sons of the kingdom growing beside the sons of the devil. Now, in this situation, inevitably, okay, there's going to be someone else's sin that's going to bring suffering into my life. So why doesn't God do something about it? Well, he had two options, okay? Option one is, hey, go ahead and, and pull up the weeds. Option two, let them just let them completely grow side by side, and then I'll separate them in the end. So why didn't God, why didn't God, why didn't Jesus choose option one? Well, he says, he told his servants, the owner tells his servants, if you, if you pull them up now, the weeds, you may pull up the wheat also. You may pull up the wheat also. You see, most of us go through times in our life, most of us who are, you know, maybe you're now following God, you're now following Jesus, where we didn't look like the sons of the kingdom. We looked like the sons of Satan, the sons of the devil. And if God was sending out his angels saying, hey, you see anybody who meets this criteria, yank them off, take them off the earth, wipe them out, then I would have been one of those wiped out. Because I wasn't done growing yet. I'm still not done growing. But hopefully I've made it obvious that I'm wheat and not a weed. And I'm not, yeah. Anyway, you get the point. You see, God is able to help us endure the hardship. Those of us who are sons and daughters of the kingdom of God, he can help us endure the hardship, endure the suffering, and, and make it home and be gathered into his barn, so to speak. But if we're snatched off the planet, if our lives are snuffed out and brought to an end before we get to the point that if we had been left alone, we would have come to where we decide to follow God and Jesus, there's, there's, there's no way to save us. So the two options are bad, but one is worse than the other. And ironically enough, it is the one where you know, people would, would have been removed immediately, whether or not they would have turned out to be wheat instead of weeds. But that does mean that we are growing alongside the sons of the wicked one. And that will bring suffering. Hold on, though. God will help us endure that pain. God will comfort us. He fills us with peace, joy, hope. And he is on our side. Thank you for listening. I greatly appreciate it. May God bless you and your loved ones and help you to overcome everything Satan throws your way.